Uh, welcome to Wildlife Wednesday, the fourth Wednesday of the month, which is crazy. Uh, my name is Rich Capitan. I'm the Education Director uh, with the Alaska Zoo. And if you don't know, um, we've been doing Wildlife Wednesday pro, uh, programming for almost two decades, for a long, long time. Um, of course, with the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, um, who's been a major partner with us uh, over the years. Um, I do want to take this moment to thank our, um, our partners that do help us bring this program to you. Uh, of course, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, uh, the uh, NOAA Fisheries Division, the uh, Alaska Geographic, the Alaska Conser uh, Conservation Foundation, and Projects in Motion. So a big thank you to our partners that make Wildlife Wednesday uh, possible. Um, tonight, uh, Alaska Geographic was kind enough to give us a gift bag that's loon related uh, and be watching in the comments for uh, a gift code that I will be putting in uh, the, uh, the chat um, that will give you a discount. I believe it's a 10% discount with uh, AKGO, Alaska Geographic. So be watching for that. Um, I will choose somebody at random this evening uh, for the loon uh, grab bag. Those are words I thought I'd never say uh, together. Loon grab bag. Um, let's see here. I do wanna introduce tonight our guest speakers. We've got uh, Devdarm Kelsa uh, with Projects in Motion. Uh, Melanie uh, Flammy, which is a, she is a, a wildlife biologist with the National Park Service. Uh, Mike Kumbi is with um, Alaska Conservation Foundation. And uh, Tamara Zeller, an outreach biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And of course, tonight's uh, show is about loons. Uh, very excited uh, as a loon is one of my favorite birds here in Alaska. And I want to take this moment. Tamara, can you do a loon sound for us? The common loon. No, maybe at the end, but I can't. Fair enough. I did put her on the spot for that. All right. Tamara, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm too nervous to do that, Rich. I'm going to turn it over to you, Tamara. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me see. I am going to try to ride this, drive this bus. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, thank Rich, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to do a short presentation about loons and a little bit about loon research in Alaska. And then we're going to watch some youth-produced videos that are going to provide a good overview of some of the research um, that's been done. And then we're going to kind of end with uh, local efforts that are going on in Anchorage to conserve uh, loons on Connors Lake. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to pause to acknowledge that much of the loon work referenced in the videos in this talk occurred on the lands of the Bering Land Bridge National Preserve, Cape Cruz and Stern National Monument, the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska, and in the city of Anchorage, which are located on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Inupiat and Dena'ina peoples. The Inupiat and Dena'ina peoples have held a relationship to this land for countless generations, and we thank these indigenous communities for their long-held traditions of stewardship and for their partnership in conservation for future generations of lands. Okay. So uh, loon studies and the videos you are about to see were truly a collaborative effort and would not have been possible without so many people and so many partners, including our funders. Many of them you see here on the screen. And it has truly been a group effort and a very satisfying experience working across agencies and with so many organizations. So I just wanted to uh, pause to give a shout out to everybody um, for working so hard together and, and great together. All right, so let's start with the basics. What are loons exactly? Um, loons are a water bird. They're often confused with a kind of duck or a seabird. They spend five months of their uh, life on freshwater lakes to raise their young and breed. And the other seven months they spend in marine environments where they molt and spend the winter. Both environments provide, provide their favorite prey items, which are fish, where they use their dagger-like bills to spear their prey and their amazing swimming abilities in the pursuit of them. They will occasionally eat invertebrates as well, and they have many adaptations that make them just excellent uh, divers and swimmers. This includes solid bones, webbed feet, and legs that are set really far back on their bodies that help propel them underwater. 
because they are adapted so well for swimming, they're very awkward on land. In fact, the name loon likely comes from an old English word loom, meaning awkward person, or a Scandinavian word lum, meaning lame or clumsy. Um, in Europe, they're also known as divers. You may have heard that term before. Because of this awkwardness on land, they often place their nests on the edge of a lake for quick escape from predators. And almost all loons, except for the red-throated loon, require a large enough lake for takeoff due to their solid bones and heavy bodies. Um, these solid bones make them more uh, or less buoyant and efficient divers, but it also makes it, them too heavy to take off directly from water. And instead, they have to run across the water to gain lift and it's sort of like a float plane. If, if you guys are familiar with watching a float plane uh, land and take off, that's what, what loons remind me of. They don't start breeding until they're about six to seven years of age, and they only lay one to two eggs per season. Um, they're also known to take a year off, meaning they don't breed every um, year. And that means they, they typically have a lower reproductive rate compared to other birds. They're long lived and can live to be 20 to 30 years old. And a really cool study of a banded pair of common loons in Sini National Wildlife Refuge in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan um, has shown that there's a pair there that they banded in the 80s and it's st they're still going strong. So these loons are about 30 to 35 years old. So that's pretty cool. All right, um, loons in Alaska. Um, we are really lucky here in Alaska. We, ha we have all five species of loons in the world. Um, the only place in North, North America with those bragging rights. And so this, this uh, slide is arranged from the smallest loon to the largest loon on order of body size. Um, Alaska provides prime breeding habitat for all the loons, um, starting with the red-throated loon, the Pacific loon, the Arctic loon, common loon, and the yellow-billed loon. Uh, you might notice that several, a uh, couple of the loon species look a, or a lot alike. The Pacific and the Arctic loon um, used to be considered one species until 1985. The Arctic loon only breeds, a uh, little small population breeds in Western Alaska with the majority of them uh, nesting in uh, Russia and, and Europe. And uh, so the other, the other loons that look alike, uh, you might notice are the common and the yellow-billed loon and they're, they're distinct, um, their distinction is their beak color. You notice on the yellow-billed loon how bright and yellow that is. Um, the other distinction with the yellow-billed and common loon is where they're found. The yellow-billed loon tends to be uh, breed only north of the Arctic Circle, where the common loons are found a lot further south. The uh, approximate global population sizes are listed below each of their, their names. Um, and you can see they kind of range, um, have a broad range. Um, so for instance, the red-throated loons, 200,000 to 600,000. Loons are really hard to monitor because they uh, nest on uh, remote, really remote lakes. Um, and so we don't have a good grasp on of what a lot of the population is doing or how big it is, especially over in Russia and, and um, remote parts of Europe. So while Arctic loons have the smallest population in Alaska, they are more abundant globally. And this makes the yellow-billed loon the rarest of all with an approximate global population of 32,000 birds with 4,000 that nest here in Alaska. So this map is a rough illustration of where you can find all the different loons in Alaska. Um, as I sort of mentioned in the previous slide, the yellow-billed loon, um, again, is found mostly north of the Arctic Circle um, in the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska on the Arctic Coastal Plain and in the Northern Seward Peninsula. And the Arctic loon, like I mentioned, is only found on the outer fringes of the Seward Peninsula. And the common loon, um, it's typically more of a boreal nesting bird, um, is typically found south of the Arctic Circle, although there are some exceptions. And then the Pacific loon and the red-throated loons can be found statewide, and, um, but the red-throated loons are mostly found in coastal areas. All right. So much of the work on loons has focused on populations in the lower 48 where human encroachment on breeding habitat has been shown to have negative effects on, on loon populations. It really wasn't until 2004 that research on loons, specific, specifically yellow-billed loons, took off in Alaska. And this was mostly in response to a petition to list the yellow-billed loon um, under the Endangered Species Act, which cited concerns over oil and gas development in the main breeding area for the species. 
uh, meetings with agencies and researchers culminated in a guiding document called the Conservation Agreement for the Yellow Bill Loon. And this is thoroughly the framework for future studies. Uh, various agencies and land managers formed the Alaska Loon Working Group and began studies to look at a variety of topics such as contaminants, migration routes, levels of subsistence harvest, population genetics, habitat requirements, and to begin long-term monitoring to determine population trends. In addition, researchers quickly realized that yellow-billed loons are ideal candidates for monitoring Arctic environments because they are long-lived and top predators that utilize both freshwater and marine habitats. So they become known as sort of the canaries of the coal mine for the Arctic. Uh, next, we wanna go into depth about a few of the studies and then move on to show you some of the youth produced videos that will sum, sum up a lot of this great work. So one mystery that researchers wanted to solve was where do loons go in the winter? Uh, we know loons molt from their beautiful breeding plumages to these gray and drab versions of themselves and that all loons migrate to coastal marine waters. But where specifically, specifically did Alaska loons go? No one knew exactly until uh, USGS researchers led by Dr. Joel Schmutz put tra satellite transmitters and geolocator tags on loons to track them. The picture on the right um, shows a, a loon leg <laughs> with some bands and a geo tiny geolocator on, on it. These uh, geolocators work by using daylight to estimate location. Um, they, the data can be used to calculate Latin longitude readings of the bird's long distance movement. So it was a really cool way to figure out where they're going. And this is what he and uh, other researchers found. Um, here's a map of Alaska, Russia, uh, Japan, and Korea. You can kind of make sense of that. And the colors on the map indicate where uh, loons were captured and tagged and where they went. So for example, the yellow indicates birds that were captured in the Arctic coastal plain of Alaska and then where they traveled to in the winter um, and fall. And the blue are loons that were uh, tagged in the Seward Peninsula of Alaska. Uh, the, green, the green dots represent loons from Nunavut, Canada. And the green or purple are uh, loons uh, tagged in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And you can see that the loons that were tagged in the Arctic coastal plain made their way down uh, Russia to Japan and over to the Korean Peninsula. And that's where they spent most of their winter and then they made the same route back. A few of them went down through the Aleutians and other parts of Alaska. The birds in the Seward Peninsula tended to uh, prefer to stay, stay closer to home and uh, were spending their winters along the Alaskan coast in the Aleutians. And then interestingly enough, the birds from Canada um, and Nunavut also made their way down to the Aleutians, but the ones from Northwest Territories Canada went overland all the way uh, to, uh, the, to winter along the, the British Columbia coast. So they have a very distinct um, and different route and require a lot more uh, freshwater lakes to be opened to land during migration. And you know, identifying where loons go in the winter is really important because um, it can help us uh, as we manage areas that are under development. And also, you know, if uh, oil spills occur, we'll know what, to, what you know, should be in that area. And if there's a really important area that we should be paying attention to for conservation. You'll hear more about the migration in one of the videos we're gonna show you. And um, with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Melanie to talk about um, some, of her some of the research and monitoring work done in the Western area of parklands. Thanks, Tamara. So um, we do long-term monitoring of yellow-billed loons in Bering Lambridge National Preserve and Cape Cruisenstern National Monument that are both either on or adjacent to the Seward Peninsula. And another part of the effort to learn about yellow-billed loons was to establish this monitoring program so that we could look at um, primary breeding habitats, not only in the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska in Alaska, but also on, on these Western Arctic parklands. The surveys utilize aircraft and we sit in tandem planes. So the pilot sits in front of the observer and you can look out the same window at the same time. And then the deal is to fly low and slow and out the same window. So we trace the outside of the lake perimeter to look for a nest 
And then we make multiple passes over lake surfaces, bays, and peninsulas to look for birds on the water. And the survey has been done here since 2005 in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS who designed the survey design and is part of the long-term monitoring program for um, the Alaska, the Arctic Inventory Monitoring Network. Next slide, please. This is a map of our survey area, and this just shows the Northern Seward Peninsula. The big yellow blocks are our yellow-billed moon monitoring sites. And then this year, we partnered with um, another person that works for Arctic Network, Jeremy Mizell, and he did um, red-throated moon surveys. So those are the little red boxes. And um, <clears throat> the yellow-billed moons like large lakes. So uh, studies on the Arctic coastal plain in National Petroleum Reserve Alaska determined that they like lake sizes of seven hectares or greater. So all of the ye or yellow blocks have all the lakes of the large sizes in them. And while the primary focus for our long-term monitoring is to study yellow billed loons, because all five species can occur here, we collect data on all of them. And we use double aircraft. You can see on the bottom, we want to increase our detection, which is our ability to make sure we didn't miss a loon. Like I might be looking out the window and I might miss a nest in my airplane with my pilot. And then Tamara will come with her team and they'll catch it. And that just gives us better detection information. Next slide, please. So what's really cool, what you can do with some of this data is kind of figure out where the birds are occurring. So these results show um, a map, kind of like a heat map of, um, they're called aggregated breeding occupancy probability. That's a mouthful. Basically, it's just telling you where your best likelihood of finding a yellow-billed loon is on the Seward Peninsula on the, um, in Bering Lambridge. And so the red dots are higher probability of detection or occurrence of a loon. And then the cooler colors like blue, there are no large lakes there, so we wouldn't find any there. Next slide, please. And what's cool is since we collect data on all five species of loons, this is like an amalgamation from all of the detections. So we can really get a good idea of important loon habitat on the Northern Sur Peninsula in this part one. Next slide, please. Some other work that we do is um, to look at other threats to yellow-billed loons, including environmental contaminants. And we partner with Dr. Angela Matz, who's the chief of the Ecological Contaminants Program at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Debbie Nigro, who is the primary investigator at Bureau of Land Management in National Petroleum Reserve Alaska for yellow-billed loons. Loons are top predators in lake ecosystems, like Tamara said, and they have long lifespans. And so over their lifespans, like toxins can uh, accumulate. And this, uh, one of the toxins we're of, uh, of concern is mercury. And um, we want to make sure that we're checking to see the birds are healthy. And so we collect an egg, which actually represents a contaminant signature off the breeding grounds. When the birds arrive to the breeding grounds, they put all of their fat resources right away into laying eggs. And so that represents the, the signature off of the breeding grounds. And then to get the local signature on the breeding grounds, we collect a prey fish from the lake that they're feeding in. And some of the other contaminants that we are studying include, um, these are mouthfuls here, persistent organic pollutants or POPs, organochlorine pesticides, perfluorinated hydrocarbons, polychlorinated biphenyl congeners, and polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Others. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but we also reach out to young people. And so this is really cool. We were able to work with Angela in her laboratory at Fish and Wildlife Service to train a bunch of young professionals to prepare the eggs and other specimens for um, chemical analysis for contaminants. So this is great. It's building their resumes and their, um, their professional contacts, as well as helping them be engaged in real natural resource management issues. Our pre preliminary results from the egg samples suggest that mercury may be approaching levels that could impede reproduction in yellow-billed loons nesting in these parklands. And similar result results were found on the Arctic coastal plain in 2006. So currently, Angela is working with partners to look and see, compare the two areas to see um, what other types and levels of contaminants are present in the loons. Next slide, please. 
So telling these stories is really important. We know emerging stories like these need to be told and shared with the public. And, you know, sometimes we're not always the best at that, <laughs> particularly me. Um, and so it's great to work with partners. One picture here is Dev Dottam Kulsa, who you'll hear from in just a moment of Projects in Motion. And we worked with Alaska Teen Media Institute too, to hold these great video production storytelling workshops and teach science communication skills to young professionals. So um, they can build their resumes and learn these skills because we've got to share these stories. When COVID hit in 2020, we had a quick pivot from field work to telework for several of our interns. And we had this back burner project from the Yellow Building Working Group to create these video stories about yellow building science. And so we were able to put these kids and young professionals to work working with Beth Donham and others to be able to um, produce uh, yellow build loons in the Changing Arctic video series, which you're gonna see, and um, the loons of Connors Lake video. Next slide, please. So these young people are shown here. We had lots of loon Zoom meetings to get through the summer in 2020 and everybody spent a lot of time on the, on the computers, but um, they produced an amazing series and also the loons of Connors Lake. We only have time to show two videos today, but we invite you to the National Park Service's YouTube channel where you can see the entire Yellow Bill Loons in the Changing Arctic video series. And at me has the Alaska Teen Media Institute has the Vimeo version of the Loons of Connor Lake video available. Now I'm gonna pass the slide off to Dev Donham Kulsa to, to begin the film fest. Thanks. He just says whatever I'm saying. Thanks, Moni. Um, thanks everyone for joining. And um, like Moni said, we have uh, several videos in the series uh, that we won't have time to show today but um, you'll be able to see those online on YouTube later on. Uh, I believe the link should be provided to you either in the chat or after the webinar. Um, so we have uh, two that we'll be showing today uh, and then plus the uh, Connors Lake video about the loons and the anchorage that we'll show after these. So I'll start off with the migration story and I'll boot your screen off here too, Tamara. Uh, hi, I'm Delaney Benson. Um, I worked with Justin on the migration video. Um, it's titled Yellow Balloons in a Changing Arctic, a Migration Story. And it shares the journeys and challenges faced by yellow balloon populations in Alaska and Canada, um, specifically a little bit more on their migration routes. Um, I hope everyone enjoys. Every spring, yellow-billed loons make an incredible journey from the coastal waters of Asia, southern Alaska, and British Columbia to the pristine tundra wetlands of the North American Arctic. The sparkling freshwater lakes scattered across northern Alaska and Canada are teeming with fish and provide a perfect haven for nesting and rearing chicks. But migration is a dangerous undertaking. Threats loom along migration routes and on both wintering and nesting areas for this international species of concern. While the North American population of loons has remained stable in the past, there are some new threats that could pose issues in the future. It's springtime in the Yellow Sea. Pairs of loons are embellished with black and white checkered breeding plumage as they prepare for their long flight to the Arctic. Loons forage in both marine and freshwater environments. Alaska and Canada, with extensive coastline and tundra habitats, provide access to both. Despite their graceful movements on water, these large-bodied divers are slow and clumsy on land. Their powerful webbed feet propel them through the water with ease, but are not well adapted for walking on the tundra. For this reason, they prefer very large, deep bodies of water with sturdy, grassy shores to build their nests and stay protected from predators. These ideal nesting spots are limited. All species of loons engage in intense competition on breeding lakes. Yellow-billed loons are fierce defenders and will use their sharp, dagger-like bills to chase, wound, and even kill their opponents. Once a breeding territory is established, pairs of loons return faithfully year after year to defend and breed on their lake once again. A particular lake may be occupied by the same pair of loons for over a decade, 
as these loons begin breeding at four to seven years old and may live to be 20 years old or more. Although, devotion to their breeding grounds comes at a cost. The reluctance to search for new lake locations reduces the likelihood of an adult Alaskan loon to ever mate with a loon from another population. Because these loons don't often interbreed, the variability in the gene pool remains low and the population can be at a greater risk when exposed to environmental challenges. Over the course of the summer, pairs of yellowbill loons will devote all of their energy to protecting, feeding, and rearing their young. One or two brown speckled eggs are laid, and after about 28 days, dark fuzzy chicks emerge. Loon chicks depend heavily on their parents for the first few weeks of their lives. Each adult takes turns foraging for fish and aggressively guarding their precious offspring. For many years, these productive lakes have provided sanctuary for the yellow-billed loons while they raise their young. But as the climate continues to warm, permafrost beneath the tundra is melting rapidly leading to the sudden drainage of valuable nesting lakes. While some drying and reforming of lakes is normal, larger lakes are draining completely and much faster than in the past. Along with the threats of habitat loss on their breeding grounds, loons may be exposed to high concentrations of environmental contaminants that collect within freshwater bodies. Contaminants such as methylmercury increase in concentration at each step of the food web. Since loons are top predators in their aquatic ecosystem, they can end up with the highest levels of mercury poisoning. The air is getting colder and days are getting shorter as yellow-billed loons once again prepare to make the grand journey south. The stunning checkered pattern worn by adults will transform into a drab gray and white plumage. Most loons nesting in Alaska follow the coast south and then head west to their wintering areas near northern Japan in the Yellow Sea. During their migration, loons come in contact with large fishing vessels and many end up as accidental bycatch in fishing nets. Canadian nesting loons set themselves apart by following a primarily overland route to their wintering areas on the southern coast of Alaska and British Columbia. Very little is known about loon behavior during winter months. Up until recently, even their migration routes were unclear. Several studies have now used satellite telemetry to map their routes, a technique in which the loons are implanted with a satellite transmitter to track their movements over the year. Little data exists on the life history of immature and non-breeding birds, but they are thought to remain in marine habitats during the summer breeding season. Sadly, not all wintering areas provide safety from environmental contaminants. In fact, the potential for exposure is greater due to the increased pollution and closer proximity to human infrastructure in these densely populated regions of the globe. As sea ice declines across polar regions, vessel traffic in the Bering Strait and Chukchi Sea continues to rise and increase the likelihood of industrial spills which can be catastrophic to any wildlife in the area. Over a lifetime, exposure to global contaminants at breeding and wintering areas can threaten the health of these long-lived birds. Alaska is home to the entire U.S. breeding population of this international species of concern. Only about 3,000 birds nest in Alaska. For perspective, the smallest NFL stadium in the U.S. can seat 60,000 people. About 500 birds nest on the Seward Peninsula, an area with two national park lands, Bering Land Bridge National Preserve and Cape Cruz and Stern National Monument. Loons that persistently return to these nesting areas are protected under the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. However, the greater proportion of Alaska's population of loons breeds in the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, an area slated for oil and gas development. Increasing human activity around breeding and wintering grounds, perpetual change in the Arctic landscape, and extremely low crossover of populations constantly put the yellow-billed loon's adaptive capabilities to the test. Threats loom on the horizon for the magnificent yellow-billed loon a rare beauty of remote northern oceans and tundra wetlands. 
Though they are incredibly resilient, are they tough enough to survive an uncertain future? Okay, so our next video is um, Loons Without Lakes, which I also created. Um, that was the first one we worked on about a year, start, started about a year ago. Um, it was viewed last spring by the Loon Working Group meetings and it details the lake drawing events in Bering Land Bridge National Preserve. Um, hope you guys enjoy that one too. <laughs> In April, rafts of yellow-billed loons float in the Yellow Sea of China, feasting on fish, fuel for their migration to their breeding grounds in Alaska. The yellow-billed loon is considered one of the 10 rarest breeding birds of the mainland US. The species is of international concern with the total global population estimated at only 21,000 birds. Approximately 5,000 yellow-billed loons depend on access to the large freshwater lakes in Alaska's Arctic for nesting, foraging, and chick rearing every summer. Unfortunately, coastal national parks in Arctic Alaska are losing lakes rapidly, a change accelerated by warming temperatures. Here in Bering Land Bridge, lakes have been forming and draining and drying for thousands of years. And we can see old uh, lake basins scattered throughout the entire park. And so what we're trying to understand is, is this happening at a more rapid rate than it used to happen historically? In 2018 and 19, several large lakes used by yellow-billed loons drained rapidly in Alaska's Bering Land Bridge National Preserve. Lake surface area dropped abruptly, and three square miles of water drained in just a single summer. Left behind were barren mudflats devoid of loons, fish, invertebrates, and vegetation. Much of the Arctic sits on top of a layer of continuously frozen soil called permafrost. As the ground warms, ice in the permafrost melts and lake shores subside or sink. 
In areas where there is more ice in the permafrost and in years with heavy snowfall, high water levels in the spring can create overflow and new pathways for water to run out of the lake. The newly formed channels cause all the water to drain and result in the disappearance of lakes and loss of habitat. Ideal lake habitats are limited. Loons are highly philopatric, meaning they return to the same nesting lakes every year. If their lakes drain, they have to search for new nesting sites. But because of intense competition among loons, most nesting habitat is already occupied. More than a decade of loon population survey data, combined with satellite imagery and Bering Land Bridge, indicate remarkable lake changes are underway. If lake loss continues, this will have large impacts on the yellow-billed loon's ability to survive and reproduce. Lake loss in the Arctic is sadly not the only threat facing loons. There's likely going to be more impacts from humans just with an Arctic that's opening, more ship traffic, more oil and gas development. The loss of sea ice is opening up the Arctic in, in a way that's not really been open before. When you have more ships that are coming through an area, by the very nature of the fact that there are more ships, you're increasing the likelihood that there could be a shipping incident. What we know from oil spills is that once it goes into a, an area of marshland or an estuaries, it really is there to stay. Think about that in the Arctic, an environment that changes much more slowly. We're going to have that oil leaching into the fish resources and everything else that is culturally important in that area. So that's the one thing that we really have to strive not to let happen. And the elbow loons are top predators in the ecosystem. They are um, obligate piscivores, which means they, as adults, have to eat fish to survive. Anything that becomes a uh, contaminant that may fall into freshwater bodies on nesting lakes um, that may then affect the fish can get into and bioaccumulate in the birds themselves. Novel shifts in the marine food web of the Arctic could also have impacts on loon survival. There would be some species that are going to be moving into the lagoons that we've never seen before, just with species moving northward. In the lagoons we studied last summer, I think we found over 30 species that were new to a particular lagoon. Small population size coupled with low genetic diversity leave the loons less equipped to adapt to rapid changes within their ecosystem. Will the yellow-billed loons be able to cope with these widespread challenges?
And now I'll hand it over to Nani and Tamara to introduce the last video of the evening, the Connor's like balloons video. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you guys see the screen? Um, what are you seeing? I think you'll have to reshare it, Tamara. I'm free share it. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Share or share screen. All right, we good? Looks good. Okay. Yeah, so that was a, a good summary of um, some of the you know concerns that we have about the Arctic and um, how loons are serving as indicators of what's going on, whether it be invasive species and changes to their, their food or the contaminants that are um, starting to show up in, um, you know, in their breeding lakes. But while it's important to understand um, what's happening with loons at a population level and in remote places like the Arctic, um, change often comes from the passions that we develop in our own backyards. And such is the story of the loons of Connors Lake in Anchorage. For those of you who are not familiar, Anchorage is a city, uh, is the largest city in Alaska with nesting loons. It's um, really cool. Can you hear me? In fact, uh, one pair of Pacific loons has been nesting right next to our airport, the, one of the busiest airports in the, in the U.S., which is designated by this little blue spot here, the Ted Stevens International Airport. And Connors Lake, which where the story takes place, is uh, designated by that red star. So living nearby Connors Lake um, were a devoted uh, natural scientist, ah! Jean Tam and Scott Christie, uh, who became concerned for the loons at Connors, at the, at Connors Lake um, because there was a dog park that was slated to be established and a uh, suitable shoreline for nesting would be threatened. So in the late 1990s, they decided to build a floating platform um, to offer the loons a safe place to nest and eventually placed cameras above the nest to capture the comings and goings. Um, anyone in the world could tune in to find out the fate of the nest, watch the chicks emerge and the loons make awkward movements um, and landings as they waddled around. And then sadly in 2019, Jean and Scott passed away in a plane crash but bequeathed funding to the Alaska Conservation Foundation to provide for the future, to provide for future loon conservation in Alaska <coughs> and con to continue their efforts at Connors Lake. So um, we're gonna show a video in, in just a minute that sort of sum, summarizes uh, this whole story and does um, including their legacy. But I wanna invite um, Mike Kumbi with the Alaska Conservation Foundation to talk a little bit about the, uh, loon funds and uh, efforts that are going on. Thank you, Tamara. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, so just as, a, um, uh, just as a piece of information, Alaska Conservation Foundation was established over 40 years ago as a charitable foundation dedicated to protecting Alaska's public lands and waters and more, in more recent years, also coordinating efforts to deal with the effects of climate change. Um, one of the things that, that the foundation does is hold funds um, that are used to complete our mission um, as part of our work. Funds are set as endowments um, with a small percentage each year available from those funds to spend on their various purposes. Um, and the purpose is that that the fund remains in perpetuity so that it's always able to, to fund the efforts that are being requested. Um, Jean Tam came to the foundation more than 15 years ago to set up, to ask to set up an endowment fund at Alaska Conservation Foundation for loon protection. And, um, that fund went into effect, um, um, unfortunately, after the death of Jean and her husband, Scott Christie. Um, and I mean, unfortunate in that they passed away much too early in life. Um, but, uh, but as a result, um, the, that fund has two main purposes. One is to protect 
and to publicize uh, uh, the loons that return to Connors Lake each year in Anchorage. Um, and if for some reason they don't come back to Aunt Connors Lake, then some other lake in Anchorage where um, loons can come back to. And then the secondary or the other purpose is to um, do efforts to protect loon habitat statewide. Um, so anyway, that those are the two main purposes of the fund, and um, and through the video, and then uh, Tamara is going to share information about what was done this first year after the fund was in place, and um, and maybe we can talk just briefly about what's planned for the future. But Tamara, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Um... The, the videos, the Yellow Bell Loon videos, as well as the video you're about to see were, were um, funded um, with, um, the, um, fr or were made with funds from uh, the Luton Fund. <laughs> and uh, we really uh, wanna um, uh, honor the legacy of Jean and Scott and uh, keep our future efforts for Loon conservation going. So with that, I'll let, Dev Zanam take it over again and we'll um, watch a video about uh, the story. And then I'll fill you in on what happened uh, last year or this year, last year. <laughs> what year is it anymore? What do you think? <laughs> it's only <a> <laughs> <time> <laughs> <So long as everywhere. laughs> I know, oh my God. And, and we just passed the pollen drum too. <laughs> <laughs> And now we have our final video. So this video is about um, Jean, Tam, and Scott Christie, and um, the loon, the Pacific loon pair that was nesting in there um, near their backyard that they went to great lengths to help protect. Jean, Tam, and Scott Christie recorded this VHS tape in 2003. Oh, the two Anchorage residents fell in love with the loon pair nesting near their house on Connors Lake. A team of reporters from the Alaska Teen Media Institute sought to figure out the full story behind this nest and the ambiguous future of the project. Well, um, maybe you could start by just like introducing yourself with your name and um, any other information that you'd like to share. I'm Jeff Fair. I have worked with loons for 43 years now. I'm Tamara Zell. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, been working with their studying loons for, God, ever since I started. So about 20 years on and off different various projects. Already. Oh. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is John McCormick. So first things first, why loons? Uh, one of the things that's very important about Anchorage is that it's the last city in North America in which loons still nest and produce offspring. The general public loves them. They're very glamorous and very, um, they're known as like the, uh, the voice of the North. So not only do they have the, the mystique that loons have, but the Pacific loons are a little bit different and they're just very beautiful. Enigmatic birds, beautiful to watch. Jean was inclined by her naturalist spirit to protect the loons from human disturbance. Um, a dog park was opened up on the other side of the lake from them. And the way to keep dogs and everything else off of the loon nests was to have a raft um, in the, in somewhere out in Connors Bog. There wasn't a lot of good nesting habitat, so they built an artificial ne nesting raft. The island was made of uh, cedar logs. It's uh, extremely heavy. It's extremely heavy when it's dry, but when it's wet, it's even worse. And then I put a screw in the hole. Putting the canopy on the raft for the loon. Going to get a screw of some kind. 
Gene and Scott recognized that, that I had been working with these artificial nesting islands for loons and just, you know, we just associated that way. It was just, you know, how do you people find each other? Well, that's how. And uh, we became, we became friends. Uh, we'd spend the whole day, you know, putting the island out there. Uh, and then we'd go back and Gene would have a, a spread of snacks out and we'd have talk. And, and a lot of the folks who got together, we'd sometimes, we only saw each other at these events. So we'd catch up. So they would launch this raft and then they got funds to put a camera um, at the nest. Could you describe a little bit about what, uh, what she was doing there with the camera? It was very interesting. She had two cameras at, at the height of all this. And she would record video from both sources. Her, her, her videos are worth a, a master's degree to, to go through them and, and pick out all these things. Um, and she provided just huge amounts of footage, the mating, the, the brooding, and the hatching of the loons. You know, Scott and Jean were, they were simple, people. They were just Anchorage residents who had an interest in birds. This is where a lot of the best conservation in, in the U.S. and of course Alaska and this world comes from. It's, it's from people who care and they cared. In the summer of 2019, Scott and Jean died together in a plane crash on the Kenai Peninsula. With their passing and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the artificial nest was not launched in 2020. And I hope that um, we'll get some very smart and energetic people, younger people, to um, maybe take, take the project up. Gene and Scott were not only great conservationists, but they were dear friends. Thanks for joining us for those. I think we have a few more words to say about the Connors Lake video before we turn it back over to Mike, or sorry, before we turn it back over to the Alaska Zip. All right, yeah, thanks, Dev Um The video uh, link, if you go to the their uh, site online, actually has a little bit um, of an add-on, um, which leads me into this year or last year. Um, so you can uh, check that out. It shows a video of this whole process. But last year, um, with funds from ACF, uh, Alaska Conservation Foundation provided, provided by Jean's uh, Loon Fund, we were able to uh, launch the raft with the help of a lot of the volunteers that have done it over the years. And um, we anchored it into the Connors Lake. And we were kind of skeptical at first because there weren't any loons around. And, you know, it's kind of, uh you know, what's going to happen. And sure enough, we got that thing anchored okay. and we're, we're paddling back out and a loon popped up and immediately what? started checking out the nest. A loon popped up? And um, so several of us went, kept going back and um, at the end of May, um, they were on the nest and they had two eggs. Unfortunately, we didn't have live stream capabilities at that time, but we did have a still camera that um, captured uh, the loons on the nest, which you can see in that, the right-hand corner. And I was happy to report that one of the chicks hatched and survived, and um, I watched it throughout the summer, and it uh, was on the lake until about August, and so that's a good sign. Um, if, and if loons make it into August and grow about, you know, two-thirds of the adult size, they're typically considered fledged. And they disappeared. So, I mean, we couldn't have asked for more of a fairy tale um, ending to the story. So 
um, that was this or uh, last year. I forget we were already past a year. And I'll let Mike uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, this coming year um, and what's what's on board for that. And last year we were able to take pictures of the of the uh, <clears throat> the loons as they progressed um, for a while until a huge storm came along and knocked the cameras out and. <laughs> Then we were done taking pictures for the season. Um, but our intention is this year to um, set cameras up again this year, but also to work with the local communications company to set up an internet um, um, connection so that we can actually um, have these um, photos uh, be live streamed. We, we're still in the process of that that negotiation, but um, eventually that is the, the plan and the purpose. And the cool thing is that um, the launching of the raft is not gonna have to happen this year because it's been, it's stayed in place for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll have to tell you that launching is one of the most amazing things you'll ever see trying to, I mean, the, the Tamara worked hard on that with a crew of five other people. And it was surprising that they were able to actually pull that off, but, um, they don't have to do that this year, which is really great. So, um, and we did see that loons came back this year, last year. Um, it was a, a great um, victory as far as all of us were concerned. Um, and we think that uh, we've got a good chance of seeing those loons return again next year. So it's a very exciting project to be a part of. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, so um, wrapping up quickly, because I know we're approaching, um, the time. Um, I just wanted to circle back to sort of the whole uh, topic of uh, tonight and why does paying attention to the Arctic matter? Why do we care, you know, what's going on with yellow billed loons in the Arctic? Um, well, the Arctic, as most of you know, helps regulate the world's temperature. It kind of acts as the refrigerator and um, for the rest of the world. And so when, the, when uh, it's not cold up there, things happen as you've see, witnessed. Um, sea levels rise and that can impact millions of people. There's uh, higher temperatures causing you know, weather events like hurricanes, wildfires. And then also um, there's impacts to the um, health and food security of, of subsistence um, users. And of course, we don't wanna see the loss of any species um, and yellow-billed loons are one of those that may be at risk. I think most importantly, we owe it to our future generations to, to really um, think about what we're doing and try to make a difference. Um, so what are loons telling us? Um, they're telling us that the Arctic is changing fast and that they need our help. And that what, you know, it may seem like you can't do anything on a global scale, but you can do something locally, um, just like Gene and Scott did. And simple actions can make a difference. Um, for instance, if you see a discarded fishing line, pick it up, recycle it to prevent uh, birds and other wildlife from getting entangled. Um, you can use alternatives to lead sinkers when you go out fishing so loons don't ingest them and um, die from uh, lead, lead poisoning. Um, reducing plastic waste, we've all heard about uh, trying to uh, reduce our use of single-use um, single plastics, so recycle and use um, reusables. And then uh, most importantly, just get involved and tell others how to love a loon because they are they are really worth loving. With that, I know we're at time, but if there's questions, um, we're definitely happy to stick around um, to answer. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, that was amazing. Two things. One, it made me miss summer. Uh, <laughs> I got really depressed because uh, it's not summer yet. Two, I know the secret of aerial surveys. It looks really, really fun, but uh, it also will make you vomit a lot uh, I'm just, so it's kind of a behind the scenes secret. Um, let's open it up to questions. If anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, someone asks, uh, do they have a loon watch in Eagle River? Um, the loon watch was combined with, um, a bunch of other citizen science projects that's run out of UAA by Audrey Taylor. It's now called Birds and Bogs. And um, I think if you were to Google that, Birds and Bogs, um, she could uh, hook you up with um, how to fill out forms. Um, that was a, a really great program that uh, Nancy Takersley started from Fish and Game back in the 1980s. And I recognize a couple of names on here. Um, 
from when I used to run it from Fish and Wildlife, I see Judith, Judith is on there. Um, and uh, so that would be my suggestion. It's now birds and bogs. Good question. Awesome, thank you. Uh, someone also asks, what can you tell us about the loons in Goose Lake? A pair seems to return each summer and sometimes they have a chick. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yeah. Um, the, <laughs> The, the Muni used to put out a barrier to sort of block off the back part of that lake um, so that the loons could nest there in peace. And I, you know, just like everything here, um, money's tight and they don't do it anymore. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, my finger's not on the pulse as much with that lake. Um, and I'm not really sure, you know, I think they, they try and it might be natural predators, might be disturbance. An interesting note, I know we're running out of time, but um, there was a loon that, a Pacific loon chick that had crawled away from Goose Lake and was found in the UAA parking lot. And Bird TLC got a call to come pick up this gull chick that somebody found and it turned out to be a Pacific loon. So piecing all the things together, we believe it came from Goose Lake. So, um, and there's, there are stories out there from common loons that uh, the chicks will travel. So it's not really sure how it got there, but happy to report that Bird TLC um, volunteers were able to raise it and we released it at Westchester Lagoon in August, but it was really interesting. So um, that's all I know about Goose Lake. How about this? Uh, are loons and grebes related? Oh, <sighs> no. <laughs> they have a lot of the same traits. So it's what's called convergent evolution where they both um, developed similar uh, life history adaptations and whatnot to their aquatic environments, but uh, loons are more related to seabirds. And oddly enough, grebes are related to flamingos. Um, and so this goes back to like, yeah, doing genetics and DNA and all the, you know, uh, what do you call it? The taxonomists, but I, I had researched this, but they, they share a lot of the same habitats. They have a lot of, you know, they both feed on fish. They're very competitive. Loons will kill grebes. Um, grebes are afraid of loons. Um, so, um, but they are not related in, in the, um, the taxonomic sense. Flamingos. I know. Get yeah. out, right? Get it. All right. Uh, how about this? Do chicks return as adults to lakes they lived on as chicks? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the last thing I read about that is they will return to within five to seven miles of their natal lake. And I know there was a banded loon up in Big Lake, if you guys are familiar with, I'm not sure who's asking the question, but familiar with um, Alaska. Um, but there were a bunch of banded, there was a banded pair of common loons on a lake up there. And um, one of their chicks was banded and it did come back um, to nest um, on a lake about a couple miles away. So. Um, that's the latest I know. I haven't been keeping up on the, the most of the research, but that's, that's the best I got. Awesome. Okay. I just want to take this moment really quick. Uh, a shout out to Larissa Hindman. You are the winner of the Loon gift bag. I will reach out to you tomorrow via email. Yay, Larissa. We will, uh, I will get, uh, I've got your information. Uh, I will send you an email on the details on how to, uh, get that. Um, really quick, someone else asks, uh, hold on here, whoops, whoops. Uh, when loons begin fall migration, does the male leave first? Do the offspring migrate to the same winter location as their parents? Oh, those are good questions. Um, do, do the males leave first? I, you know, it depends. Um, if they have a chick, um, one of the adults will leave first. I'm not sure if it's a male or female. Um, that usually just one sticks behind um, with the chick. If they don't have chicks or if they failed breeding that year, they'll both take off. But I'm not sure if it's necessarily together. Um, I, I don't know that for sure. Um, as far as the chicks uh, migrating um, to the same areas as the adult, is that what the question was? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't think anybody knows, but... Uh, both adults, um, so one adult will stay with the chick until it's ready to sort of get and ready to go, but it will leave the chick and the chick will, will still stay on the lake a couple of weeks past when both adults leave. So they don't migrate together, if that makes, if I made sense. So say, you know, Connor's lake had a, 
you know, they had their chick. Well, it wouldn't be uncommon for um, both adults to have left um, the chick for a couple more weeks so it could keep growing. Um, and then it'll, so what they do once they leave is one of those big mysteries. And um, unless we can, you know, get more satellite tags on birds and they're just really hard to study because they're, um, yeah, they're just hard to study. <laughs> but so I don't know. It's a good question though. Science is full of lots of I don't knows. It's true. Yeah. All right, last question. Uh, this is a very familiar last name, Carrie Zeller. Ah. Oh, <laughs> my uh, sister. Says, uh, <laughs> she says she would love to see data from Asia about where certain pairs nest and if they return to the same locations every year. Yes, um, I would too. Uh, it's such a mystery over there uh, as well, I guess. The as you can imagine, Russia is not exactly an open uh, and welcome place to go do research. So um, we don't know anything. So I'm with you. Oh, let's take a trip and go do it. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, the loon stuff was great. Again, it made me homesick for summer. Uh, boy, I can't come fast enough. Um, I want to take this moment really quick to thank our uh, sponsors again, our partners here. Uh, of course, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, of course, the National Park Service, uh, the NOAA Fisheries Division, Alaska Geographic, the Alaska Conservation Foundation, and Projects in Motion. So thank you uh, to all of those wonderful partners for uh, helping us do a, a neat uh, presentation like this. Um, thank you for all of the loon folks here tonight. And of course, thank you from the Alaska, um, the Alaska Zoo. Um, we will see you next month, stand by, March 23rd, a year in the life of a lesser yellow legs. So those bird nerds tune in. And then the last of the season will be April 27th, uh, Belugas and Cook Inlet. So pretty good stuff. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Thanks for uh, everybody that gave the presentation tonight and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you everyone. Delaney Vinson was on. She was on the videos. Yay, Delaney. Hey, Delaney. Oh, Delaney Thanks, was on. Good. good. Bye bye. 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 All right. Look at them go. They're like falling like leaves.